Uh, welcome back to these series of lectures on Western Civilization, Part 1. Uh, our last lecture, we tried to get inside Columbus's head to see what the Earth looked like to him by examining his maps. In this lecture, I want to talk about um, some of those factors that Columbus had to, uh, to deal with in making his calculations. So we're just going to go through some, some, some big topics here, uh, one by one, and I'll briefly give you some sense of why they're significant. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is feudalism, the, uh, the feudal world which Columbus uh, grew up is, uh, is a factor here in his thinking, and it works like this. Columbus is raised in Genoa, a, sea, a seaside port city, a working port, a cosmopolitan, people coming and going from different places, from Africa, from the Middle East, from Spain, uh, Europe, uh, languages uh, that Columbus probably never understood that he would hear uh, he probably saw religious rituals that he did not understand. He probably smelled food cooking that he had never tasted. Genoa is a cosmopolitan, uh, sophisticated port city <coughs> on the Mediterranean. Now, I think this is important because Columbus is, does not have the mindset of the typical European peasant uh, who might live uh, inland uh, in the interior of Italy or France or Germany. He's not bound by the uh, constrictions of feudalism. And let me briefly uh, characterize feudalism, as you can see a depiction of it here. Uh, I'll characterize it in three ways. First, it is essentially a decentralized system. There's no overarching authority over feudal Europe, except perhaps uh, the Pope would probably be the closest uh, to a universal authority. Uh, feudal Europe. Uh, you could probably just as easily call it Christendom. Uh, I believe that's what most of the people, most of the Europeans thought of themselves as Christians living in Christendom. Uh, feudalism is also characterized as a hierarchy of distinct classes. At the apex of this uh, triangle you see uh, the king, uh, the pope. Uh, as you go down the pyramid you'll see nobles and vassals and further down knights and lesser nobility. And then at the bottom of this pyramid, you have the vast population of peasants or uh, serfs. So it's a, uh, a society of distinct classes. There's not very much mobility here. The, uh, a peasant is more than likely going to remain a peasant. A nobleman will more than likely remain a nobleman. A peasant is not going to grow up to be a king or, uh, or a pope. Now, not only is it a hierarchy of distinct classes, but there is an element of reciprocity here. Uh, the king sends protection and land downward. Uh, the vassals, the nobility, the knights, they serve the king by collecting his taxes or fighting for his kingdom. Um, and then, of course, at the bottom, the vast peasantry supply the food up the pyramid, uh, the wine and the beer and the bread and, and other things uh, to keep the society functioning. So it's a reciprocal system. Everybody owes everybody something. Uh, peasants receive protection in land and they send taxes in the form of food and drink uh, up the pyramid to feed the society. So Columbus is not trapped in this mindset. Columbus is, uh, is growing up in Genoa allows him to see a much wider world where ambition and uh, ingenuity and energy come into play. And I think that's an important to understanding Columbus's mindset that he, that he is not constrained by the feudal institutions. Uh, a second factor here that's is very interesting, we don't talk about it in the West that much, but in the early 15th century the Ming Dynasty established uh, what they called the treasure fleets and uh, the Admiral uh, Qing He uh, took these treasure fleets and uh, sailed throughout much of the Old World um, all the way to East Africa uh, into the uh, Strait of Hormuz and on and on. Now, a book was written some years ago uh, by a retired British submarine captain, I believe. I think it's called 1421. In this book, the author made the argument that Ching He crossed the Cape of Good Hope and entered the Atlantic, and then uh, later picked up the westerlies and shot across the Atlantic to the New World. Um, I've read this book. There is some evidence. I'm not convinced of it entirely. But you can see that this would fundamentally change our understanding of world history and the founding of the Western Hemisphere. Now, back to the treasure fleets for a moment. Um, 
These treasure fleets were essentially sent out to collect tribute for the Chinese emperor. Uh, China is uh, self-sufficient and does not need trade per se. So the treasure fleets would take, say, a giraffe back to the emperor, exotic plants and animals. Uh, as we move on into the 15th century, we discover that the Ming treasure fleets are destroyed uh, by the Chinese. The, uh, the Mandarin leadership decided that uh, since China could not be attacked by sea, uh, the treasure fleets weren't needed for protection. Since China was self-sufficient, the treasure fleets were not needed for trade. And thus the manpower and the capital that went into maintaining the treasure fleets is now going to be transferred to another large project uh, extending the Great Wall of China. So I bring this up because uh, it, it tends to complicate the story a little bit. Um, the, another factor that Columbus is going to have to deal with here concerns Islam. Uh, there are three great Muslim kingdoms here in the Middle Ages, uh, starting from west and moving east. You have the Ottoman Empire centered in what today we call Turkey, and the Ottomans, of course, extended through the, uh, the Middle East, North Africa, Egypt, uh, and into uh, the Balkans in uh, southeastern Europe. If you go f east from there, you would encounter the Safavid Empire centered in what today we call Iran. And then further east, you would encounter the Mughal Empire, centered in what today we'd call northern India and Pakistan. These are the great Muslim empires of the Middle Ages. Now, historians have um, traditionally referred to these as the Muslim middleman when they discuss Columbus. Uh, the role here is important uh, that these empires play as, let's say, pepper or cinnamon or nutmeg or cloves, as these spices make their way from east to west, uh, they move through these Muslim empires. And at each exchange, of course, the price of these goods goes up. Everybody wants to take their cut and get their share of the profit. So the Muslim middleman uh, turns pepper into an extravagantly expensive uh, commodity for Europeans. Now, look what Columbus is proposing. He's going to avoid the Muslim middleman entirely. He's going to cross a narrow ocean going westward, uh, get to the Far East quickly, safely, cheaply, collect the spices and the silks and the other uh, goods, and bring them directly back to Europe without the middleman. This is a very uh, uh, tempting proposition, isn't it? If we could secure these things without paying this huge markup, uh, then it would be worthwhile. So keep this factor in mind, the Muslim middleman and Columbus's uh, desire uh, to avoid them entirely so that he can bring the goods back to Europe at a much lower price. And then uh, another factor that is of interest to us, uh, historians refer to it as the ritual of possession. And it works like this. When Columbus reaches what he thinks are the Indies on the other side of the world, uh, he begins to lay claim to these islands for the king and queen of Spain. And what he does, he'll, he'll get off the big ship and get into a, a small boat uh, with a notary and some soldiers and they will paddle over to an island. Uh, they'll gather up the natives and uh, Columbus will uh, read a proclamation to the natives. And the proclamation essentially says that henceforth this island and uh, your souls, referring to the natives, now belong to the king and queen of Spain. And you can read this in Columbus's journal. It's very interesting. He says, uh, he does this over and over. And at the conclusion of this ritual, he says, and I was not contradicted. Uh, this is very interesting, isn't it? These natives have no idea what Columbus is saying as he reads to them in Italian or, uh, or Latin the, the script on a proclamation. Uh, these natives, of course, are a people of oral tradition. Uh, they have no literacy. Uh, so they cannot possibly contradict Columbus, having no notion of what he's saying. Yet Columbus goes through this ritual repeatedly. Uh, I think he does it because he wants to lend an air of legality 
uh, to the taking of other people's property and indeed of other people. Now in time, Columbus will grow bored with this, uh, this tiresome ritual and he will begin to claim islands off the starboard side by simply gazing upon them. Um, this is a nice way to collect real estate. Uh, no paperwork, no lawyers, no real estate agents, no money. Uh, you claim property by looking at it. Uh, you have to give Columbus credit for having uh, an extraordinary amount of nerve, uh, uh, ego, uh, strength of conviction, whatever you want to call it. So these are some of the factors uh, that go into uh, Columbus's voyages. And uh, in our next lecture, our last lecture on Columbus, we will pick up and talk about uh, the Columbian Exchange, uh, which was historians view as sort of the decisive turning point uh, in history. Thanks for your attention.